So good afternoon. Welcome to Essential Work, Excessive Risk, Warehouse Work in Chicago and Southern California. We very much appreciate the time that you have taken to be with us. I'm Teresa Cordova, Director of UIC's Great Cities Institute. We are honored to be hosting you today. I would also like to acknowledge our co-sponsor for today's event, the Center for Urban Economic Development, or QED, as so many of you know them by. Special shout out to Nick Theodore, QED's director. He and Beth Cotelius have produced reports on warehouse workers, particularly as it relates to changes in technology. Beth is a senior researcher with Great Cities and she is also associate director of QED. Beth is gonna lead a conversation today with warehouse workers from Warehouse Workers for Justice in the Chicago region and the Warehouse Worker Resource Center in Southern California from the Inland Empire. Uh, we know uh, more now than ever how warehouse workers are essential to our lives. Uh, they were essential to us even uh, before COVID-19, before the pandemic, and now more than ever. Um, we, we, we so rely on them and they have been those who've also been taking some of the biggest hits around COVID. But we you know when we order those books online and or or whatever it is, and we you know we often don't think about okay, so what's on what's on the other end, and what's it really like to be a warehouse worker, and what are some of the issues that they're facing? So we thought it was important to 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 bring this event together, and so I'm very happy that I'm able to introduce Beth Cotillius, who's going to lead a conversation, um, and then uh, towards the towards the end we'll do this for about 45 minutes. And then we will uh, allow some time for some, some questions and comments. So with that, I'm very happy to turn it, in, turn it over to Beth Patelius, Associate Director of QED and Senior Researcher from the Great Cities Institute. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks so much for inviting us to talk about warehousing today. Um, the pandemic, as you were just saying, I think has really kind of shot warehousing into the limelight um, in a way that's kind of unprecedented. Um, it's, it's been pretty invisible for a long time. I think to consumers because we don't really interact with warehouse workers, right? Um, it's easy to disconnect the clicking by from the long chain of events that that actually initiates. Um, but um, you know, you, we saw warehouse workers and other essential workers being called heroes um, throughout the pandemic. But I think that rhetoric has has rung really hollow for a lot of workers who saw meager hazard pay if they saw any at all, even in the face of mounting health and safety risks. So we'll get to hear from organizers um, and workers today about these risks and about campaigns they're running to improve warehouse working conditions. Um, we're joined today by Shaharia Kausji, who is the executive director of the Warehouse Worker Resource Center in the Inland Empire of Southern California, uh, Roberto Clack of Warehouse Workers for Justice in the Chicago region, and Ronald Jackson, a former worker at the Mars Warehouse here in Chicago. So I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork and then we're going to summon all of these wise folks um, expertise on, on the warehousing industry. So I want to zoom out first for a moment. Um, so if it feels safe to do so and comfortable, close your eyes. Um, imagine you're floating in space and looking down at the blue dot of planet Earth and imagine a line stretching from Shenzhen, China. This is actually a geography quiz you tuned into today. So Shenzhen, Shenzhen China to your front door. And now imagine tying a string. Um, around the front door of the factory in Shenzhen and the front door of your apartment. This string is a long, complex, globalized supply chain. And so a pair of sunglasses that's manufactured at that plant in Shenzhen has to make its way to your doorstep. And they cross oceans and continents and they pass through a lot of different in intermediaries on that journey. And so logistics is the supply chain function that is responsible for orchestrating that entire journey, right? We can think of it as the circulatory system of the economy or of capital. And warehouses as a particular logistics activity are the really the places where supply and demand collide and get calibrated. So the sunglasses leave the factory, they're on the move, they're sailing on ships, they're unloaded at ports, they're shipped by rail and truck. These are goods in motion, right? Until they reach the warehouse. The sunglasses sitting on a warehouse shelf aren't generating any value for a firm. In fact, um, the cost of keeping them on that shelf is actually eating away at the profit from selling the sunglasses, right? So the focus of supply chain management has been for goods to be in near constant motion. So goods not in motion cease to be generating value. 
And this has caused warehouses to be treated basically as like a black hole in the supply chain that just sucks money without creating value. This is the idea of like supply chain managers. I do think e-commerce is shifting this calculus a little bit, but we can get into that uh, if we want. So all of this is to say that the structure of the industry, the role that warehousing plays for the rest of supply chains contributes to the creation of degraded working conditions. How? Constant attention to containing costs and improving efficiency of that black hole, that money suck, has translated into downward pressure on the cost of labor and pushing workers harder in the name of calibrating supply and demand. All in the context of weak labor protections, right? So I, th I think we need to be really specific about the kinds of structural conditions that shape labor market dynamics, not as a way to say, like to explain it away and say, oh, you know, th this is never going to change as a way to say, this is why the task is monumental and here's who stacked the decks to identify how power is distributed along supply chains and how risk is getting shifted away from firms into labor markets and landing in workers laps. So you can open your eyes if they're still closed or you know, if you like my lullaby, you can keep them closed. Um, so a couple of brief stats on the warehousing industry, just to give you an overview. There's more than a million workers um, toiling in warehouses across the country. The workforce is disproportionately young, male, and Black and Latinx. Um, warehousing once, you know, in the 80s or so, uh, offered middle-class jobs to those without college education, but today offers limited routes to advancement, low wages, and poses significant health and safety risks. The work-related injury rate is nearly twice that of other private industry workers, higher than construction, coal mining, and most manufacturing industries. And even though employment in the sector has shot up because of e-commerce, even before the pandemic, workers' wages have stagnated for decades. Real wages in 2019 were actually lower than they were in 2001. Um, the industry is actually really varied. Um, most warehouses are much smaller than the big Amazon fulfillment centers we think of and have way less technology than, than, um, than those uh, fulfillment centers do. Um, and finally, there's a lot of outsourcing, both to third party logistics companies that will run a, a warehouse operation for a retailer, say, or and also to, to temporary staffing agencies who provide um, a lot of labor, uh, depending on the warehouse. I want to say a couple things about technology, um, and we can get into this more if, if people want. Lots of observers predict widespread job loss due to automation, um, but a study that uh, I conducted with Nick Theodore showed that over the next decade, we think that job quality, not job quantity, is a far more pressing concern. That is the working conditions and content of warehouse jobs are likely to change with potentially negative impacts on workers. The adoption of new technologies has the potential to improve the quality of warehouse jobs by alleviating the most strenuous tasks. For example, you could have a, a, an, an autonomous mobile robot um, that might reduce the amount of walking necessary. But these potential improvements in job quality, our study found, are likely to be coupled with increases in the pace of work, which could lead to a net deterioration of, work, of working conditions. So even though warehousing has been a laggard in terms of tech adoption, COVID has increased firms' interest in new forms of technology and automation, particularly among e-commerce operations. But given the uncertainty around how much of changes in consumers' buying habits are going to persist post-pandemic, firms are still really cautious in terms of making major investments in new kinds of technology. So we're not seeing a huge shift right now. Uh, although, you know, once, once volumes stabilize a little bit, we, we may start to see a shift. But in our report, Nick and I argued that um, partial automation and labor augmentation are much more likely scenarios in the next five to 10 years. And I think we still stand by that assessment. Deteriorating job quality is a much more likely outcome than, um, than mass unemployment. Um, so now I want to turn to our friends um, to talk a little bit more about job quality and workplace issues in, in warehousing. So, um, Shaharia, could you talk a little, little bit about WWRC's work around health and safety and what you all have encountered during the pandemic? Yes, and thank you for having us. Um, so basically, over the last few years, we've been talking to workers and organizing to uh, improve conditions around health and safety. So when, when the pandemic hit, um, immediately, you know, hundreds of workers came, um, started reaching out to our organization to find out really basic information, not just around, you know, how to stay safe, but also especially around what kinds of uh, rules, um, rules and protections they had in workplace. Workers were coming across situations where they were being told to go to work, not being informed about 
any kind of um, COVID infections early in the pandemic, not receiving any kind of protective equipment or social distancing. And the, you know, a lot of employers were just saying, just deal with it. If you don't want to deal with it, don't come into work. Um, and so a lot of these workers, um, you know, across the country are employed through staffing agencies on very contingent you know, basis. They basically have to fight to get to work every day. And they were saying, what can I do to make sure that I stay safe and protected in this, in this workplace? But also, how do, I, how do I know if there is an infection? Is, are there any rules? And initially, there weren't any. Nobody, you know, the state Cal OSHA um, administration didn't have any specific rules. There were kind of, a, you know, some, some guidelines that came together very early, but they weren't binding. And the, the reality is, like, it doesn't matter. Like, there wasn't any real enforcement happening on the ground. Even the Cal OSHA inspectors weren't working from home at that time. So there was no real context for us to say anything except it's between you and your coworkers to organize to improve your conditions, right? Um, if it's just you speaking up in the in the workplace, um, you're you're in a place where there's a lot of uh, risk of of you being terminated, as you know. Um, but at the same time, that is the the way to to build power is to to talk to your coworkers, um, try to figure out what's going on, try to come up with what you guys think is is appropriate and safe. And um, you know, call on your employer to follow that, and we you know we can support you. And that's basically, you know, been our model from before pan you know, pandemic till now. Um, that you know, groups of workers getting to joining together without a union or with a union can change their workplaces. So what we saw was that you know, in our region, the Inland Empire is you know very similar to Will County, the region outside of Chicago, where there's a lot of um, you know a lot of Amazon warehouses, a lot of major warehouses, and Amazon is our biggest private employer in our, our region outside of LA County. A lot of Amazon workers came to us especially and said, you know, they're not telling us anything. It's, you know, completely out of control. People are getting sick left and right and we don't know what to do. So what we did was really try to start bringing together information about what was going on in some of those major warehouses, because we know that if you uh, take on and, you know, make sure that the biggest employers and the biggest players in the sector are held accountable, a lot of the other the other warehouse operators are watching. They say, "Oh, they you know Amazon got sighted. We're going to need to watch ourselves too." We see that again and again. So we want to make sure that some of the bigger employers did get uh, checked, and that that there were workers that were you know coming to us that we were able to support them to make sure that some of those big employers in Riverside and San Bernardino counties, um, like Amazon, were held accountable. We support workers to pull together complaints to the state, both in public health context and also. Cal OSHA to say, you know, this isn't happening under the way, you know, the way that it should. Um, they're not training us. They're not providing us with protective equipment, but also um, workers are facing retaliation when they speak up. Um, and so, you know, we think that that's, you know, a, a good step in the right direction. We think that um, in general, the, you know, the, the way that um, COVID played out, it, you know, really kind of brought a lot of the problems in the sector into even bigger light. So the problems in the sector already were that workers were on very short, you know, employment uh, terms and not not able to stick around very long. Workers are on very high productivity standards, forced to move very quickly and, and don't have time to um, move safely, but also don't have time to clean up and wash their hands or, um, you know, maintain their facility if they're trying to, you know, keep keep the site clean. Um, and all those things exacerbated because Amazon was at the same both at the same time facing these kinds of contexts where people needed to do more to stay safe, people needed to walk a little bit slower to stay safe, but also their product, their production doubled because so many people were ordering from Amazon suddenly and staying home. So those two things kind of met you know, at Amazon, we think um, last year where the productivity went very, very high and the workers were the ones who, who paid. Yeah, I, I've heard and, and read a lot of media stories um, corroborating all of that and, and really speaking to the, um, yeah, that collision, right, of like this huge spike in demand for, for online shopping um, and, and, you know, warehouse operators, I think, have, have long said that, you know, they can't find enough workers. Um, and so I think, you know, a, a shortage of workers and an increase in demands in the midst of a pandemic um, is not a recipe, uh, not a good recipe. Um, Roberto, can we turn to you for, for, the, for a similar discussion about what you all have seen um, during the pandemic? I know you all have, have also focused more recently on, 
um, on the food packaging industry. So could you talk a little bit about what's been happening in Chicago? Definitely, um, and I prepared something. Uh, but in January, we released the COVID jungle uh, research report, which uh, detailed outbreaks, retaliation, and death at some of the country's largest food brand facilities, and mostly in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, these brands include Walmart, Amazon, Mars, General Mills, Burger King, Kellogg's, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, Goya Food, Nabisco, and the, the list actually went on and on. Uh, Chicago's the second biggest food region in the uh, country. Um, in our report, we found 49% of workers had no health care. 20% relied on government health care, Medicare, or Medicaid. 65% um, of respondents had either gotten sick or knew of someone who did in the workplace. 11% of them knew of a coworker who died. 85% uh, of those who complained about safety said nothing had been done, or worse, they were retaliated against, uh, which we'll, we'll hear from Ronald, who will tell his story. Uh, and a shocking 96% of workers were not receiving hazard pay. That is, as of now, during this second peak, which is completely devastating in the warehouses. Um, warehousing is the worst place to be outside of a nursing home as far as uh, getting the infection in the state of Illinois. Um, you know, and I know this crisis has affected uh, many of us. Um, we're tired, we're feeling burnt out. Um, there are many emotions that we're feeling. Um, but as a leader of Warehouse Workers for Justice, you know, I'm angry. Uh, there's always been big and complicated problems in this industry. And I never thought I'd be a leader during a time of mass casualties. Yet this is exactly the challenge that we've been faced with. It weighs on me the elaborate length of the subcontracting and staffing agency models that prevent workers from having power and decent jobs. And how much of that has led to unnecessary deaths in the industry? You know, how it's immoral that mostly who this falls on is the black and brown workers, um, you know, who, who can't even get direct employment, who can't get good pay, they don't have benefits, and they don't have a say. You know, many of the corporations have been putting profits over people for years. But in this particular case, they put profits over lives. That's the story of the COVID jungle. And while I lead an organization largely from home, you know, I've reflected on the price that was paid to keep me safe. People died to bring us food. People died to bring us household products. People die to keep us safe. You know, as the writer Sarah Lazar noted, we called them heroes, but that was mostly a way to cover up how we failed these essential workers. As a society, we ask those who are already the most oppressed and vulnerable to carry out this sacrifice, mostly people of color. As my staff and former warehouse worker, Bobby Frierson would say, essential sacrifices. As the leader of WWJ, if I'm not to memorialize and remind society of the sacrifices of this workforce, who will, really? We need to mourn these essential workers, especially the ones who died because of negligence. I say we honor them by creating real and lasting change in the industry. We honor them by being morally outraged and fighting like hell. They were always essential. They were always important. Warehouse workers matter and nothing moves without them. Nothing moves without them. Nothing moves without them. The working class will end this pandemic, but let's not forget what happened to us. And at the end of this, we need to be resurgent and we need to come out swinging. We can create a better workforce after this disaster, but we will need a dynamic labor movement that works in coalitions with other to do this. Let's lead with a sense of moral indignation for those unnecessarily lost. That's what we can do. Let's lead with a sense of urgency for racial justice, fighting for racial justice, understanding that worker justice is directly tied into that. We didn't wanna be the worker center of the second most dangerous place to work to be at all. 
but I'll be damned if we don't rise to the occasion. The warehousing and logistics industry oppresses many in Will County. They rip off our communities through tax breaks. They ruin our roads without paying to upkeep them. They drain our water table without helping to replace it. They destroy our local environment while being the leading contributor to climate change. And science warned us about the dangers of a pandemic. Science is warning us about the dangers of climate change. It's going to be worse, you know, and that's why at Warehouse Workers for Justice, we support a Green New Deal as a way to stimulate our economy and put people back to work as a way to get out of this crisis, because I don't want the next crisis to be worse. Will County is one of the most important economic regions in the world, and if we want to hold corporate America accountable to the community's workers' environment, let's get it organized, and thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I got goosebumps <laughs> uh, when you were talking about like people, it, it's really important, right? That we remember that people have died, you know, to keep us safe. Um, those of us who've had, you know, experience more privilege. And I really appreciate you highlighting that. And I also just wanted to say for both these organizations, um, you know, it's like, I'm a researcher, I do my research, I put out research, right? And I think it's also really important when organizations undertake their own research projects and, um, and really shape them um, to the campaigns and to the experiences of workers. And so we've put in the chat um, links to, to reports that both of these organizations have released recently about health and safety and warehousing. Um, Ronald, let's turn to you now. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about Mars, um, what happened there, and then um, a little bit about the campaign that you were a part of? Uh, like I say, uh, I came to Roberto Dam, uh, me and Roberto and Sean worked way back before the Mars, but with the incident with Mars is that when the pandemic started, we didn't know what was going on. We seen people out in hazard suit and everything, and we, you know, wonder, you know, what, what, what's going on? They was, you know, checking us temperatures when we was in the car and everything. So, you know, they never broke it down to us what's really, you know, what was really going on. You know, they had us working and, you know, ain't really saying nothing about the pandemic. They ain't saying really nothing, just have us working. So well, I would talk to Roberto, Sean and Bobby, you know, about the, the issue that was going on in there. So as uh, it got from like, from bad to worse, we was talking about it. You know, we had a meeting in the morning. They said, you know, if you got any issue, bring it up to the table. So, you know, I had an issue at Mars saying that, you know, about the uh, pandemic because we had some workers that was online, caught the pandemic and they allowed them to work. And then at the end of the day, about four hours later, they sent them home. And instead of them closing the building, they kept us working. So, you know, we had a meeting and, and they was talking about it. So I said, you know, about testing, I said, you know, people are scared they want to get tested. And I said, you know, the state doesn't have a problem with y'all bringing in someone to do the testing. Some of the supervisors say, no, 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 we can't do that. So I called my state officials, they said, no, the state doesn't have a problem with it. So later on down the line, during the meeting, they got on the phone and said, okay, oh yeah, it's not a problem, it's not a problem. So when I went back onto the line, one of the plant manager, the main plant manager pulled me over to the side and said that, um, I didn't appreciate what you did. I said, what? Scan my workers. I say, how does I'm scan your workers? Uh, with the pandemic, I say, look, I said, if you any kind of boss and you want to work your workers here secure, get them all tested so everyone can be feel safe. If you get everyone tested and they come back negative, then everybody say, hey, my test said negative, negative. So I'm, I'm good. So how's that? Well, I don't like what you're doing. If you do it something like that again, I'm gonna talk to your company and I'm gonna have you uh, fired. But that, that, that didn't stop me. I still had uh, like over hundred people sign some petition about the work conditions in the building and everything. So it, it seems like it, it didn't go away, they just, waiting to find a reason to, to fire me. And down the line, it happened. They, they, they fired me, I, you know, they fired me. I went to the labor department. I had, you know, had filed a complaint against them, a, a form of retaliation. And what's making it so funny is 
the Labor Department found them guilty of retaliation, but they didn't find them guilty of firing me. And I'm saying, how is that not a form of retaliation? If you have plant managers saying, we're going to get rid of you. That, 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 that don't make no sense. It seems like, oh, well, we're not going to, it, it, it doesn't make sense. And then you want workers to come forward to complain about the condition. If you have companies like OSHA and the Labor Department don't protect the workers, and we don't want to know the condition in the building. You can't send someone in there and say, oh, this is the, this is this, this. We don't want to work there. We know the safety condition in the building. But instead of them listening to us, they'll pay someone $100,000 to come into the building and say, oh, that's cool, that's good, that's good, that's good. Then when you go to the Labor Department or OSHA and say, what is the requirement? Or oh, well, they don't have to do nothing but this, and they don't have to do this. But we're the one that need to be protected. We're giving you a positive line to say, look, this is what needs to be done. You can't put a big plastic sheet up and saying, this is going to protect you. But yet you still want us to ship out the candy. And we're tripping over what you put up. When we're saying we have a better way to protect us and you refuse to listen to us. But if one of us gets hurt at that job, the first thing they say, you got to take a drug test. That's the first thing that, that come out of their mouth. You have to take a drug test. But we're telling you, what you got in place is endangering us. And number two, you have workers who come in sick. How is it that OSHA or the Labor Department can let you keep a company open, but a football team who comes in uh, positive, they close the whole facility down? It's like I said, Mars put profit over people every time. We're like the Suicide Squad. And if you've seen that movie, the government don't care. They want the job done. And that's the way with Mars, Amazon, any other warehouse company. They don't care about their workers. They care more about their profit. Let's see one of the CEOs come in there and work for a month and see what they feel safe with the work condition in there. So you, you got to ask yourself, let's take um, the incident in Atlanta. Where is the equipment to detect the refrigerator system to let them know that it was a leak? I mean, they got carbon monoxide detectors. So where is that equipment at? Now you got to ask OSHA. What happened to that? Six, six people lost their life because those companies put money over lives and it's still going on today. If you think you, your kid's saying, well, mom going to work to make some money, next thing you know, mom and dad ain't making it back because these companies, rather put a dollar bill over you. And I mean, I mean, everybody's seen the movie Trading Place where they bet on the man's life to change it around. And look what happened. And it's the same way Mars is doing, Amazon is doing. I mean, look at the biggest CEO. He, they, make, they made profit. You would think that during the pandemic, all these companies would lose money. It shows all these companies made money but they would not give us, they would not keep our hazard pay. What they did is they told us, we're not gonna call it hazard pay, we're gonna call it appreciation pay. But the pandemic's still going, but we lost that, we lost that appreciation pay within I think two or three weeks. After they got a tax break and they got a bailout. So now you you wonder, we we can't even get a bailout, we can't get sick day. I mean, we 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 lost we lost everything. And that's, that's what I'm saying, we lost everything. Now, what I have done in the past is with Roberta and Sean, we had started then in, when I worked at IFCO, they had one of the worst safety issues in there. They had a, a long orange extension cord running over water. And they want us to pick up these trays and we had to go through this water. We took pictures and everything, sun of the ocean. You know what ocean did? Nothing. They find them, I don't know, was it $25,000 or 250000 And that's all OSHA did. Nothing else. The condition in there was, was outrageous. The, the equipment in there was faulty, just the same way as it is in Mars. It's faulty. If you ask for the records of when the last time these equipment been serviced, you, you might have to wait months to get them because they're protected by elected official 
in my opinion, who's getting paid off to look the other way. Because if you had the so-called elected official really being on the side of the worker, we wouldn't even be here. Yeah. But you got to ask yourself, who is they for? They get the donation, but we know what their donations are. We know the donations is not for us because we don't even get nothing from Mars. Any warehouse workers you look at, they don't get no money, really. They, they, they don't get nothing. And even if you come... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there. We're, we're going to circle back to some of You raised some really important issues, I think. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and, you know, some of, the, some of the exact issues that Ronald is talking about, I think, um, are really what are the, I mean, they, they're the baseline in the industry, right? And, and so much has been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, and so I want to bring up what I, I think is probably on a lot of people's minds, which is the um, Amazon organizing campaign in Bessemer, because I think it um, in, in Bessemer, Alabama, um, I think it actually it's like a distillation of all of these issues in one place where the workers um, have sort of like finally said, OK, you know what, um, our only route to dignity is this way. Um, and, and they've come together and they are currently, um, as we speak, voting um, whether or not to unionize with the RWDSU. Um, so I'm wondering if you all want to reflect at all on, on that campaign, what you think it means for um, organizing in, in Will County or in the Chicago region, in the Inland Empire. Um, yeah, did you still have like some, some top line thoughts about it? I heard from some of the Amazon workers that the Amazon manager is using a temp service and saying to the people who work at Amazon to, to put pins on and say no union. They're using temp workers to discourage working because union, I mean, temp workers can't become part of the union. But for the workers who work for Amazon, they is using the temp workers to, 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 to have them not to go union. And see, that's a dirty tactic. See, Amazon got this big old commercial on like they really care about America. But why is it that you're using this tactic to, to discourage? And that's who they use. They use temp workers because if temp workers stand up, those who stand up will be gone. And this is the way they Amazon and all these big companies use. They use this tactic that if you're speaking out about something that's not fair, you're disposable. You're a suicide squad. And that's how they get, that's how they keep the dirt, that's how they keep the unfair labor going on because they get rid of that worker for no just cause at all. You did nothing, you can work there for two years. But as soon as you, you, you say something, you're gone. And the labor department will not protect you because you're speaking out against unfair practice. But let them tell it, uh, he did this and he did that. Wait a minute, if he did this and did that, how long has he worked as this company? And that's why you don't have a union now and Amazon and a lot of these companies because they're using a dirt, they're using the dirty tactic by using temp workers to stop a union lines and coming in there. You know, you know I've actually had I, I, a lot of my interviews are with um, either employers or sometimes temporary, you know, temporary, temporary staffing agencies. Um, and I've had, you know, employers tell me flat out the reason we use temps um, is in order to avoid union organizing. I'm not saying that's what all of them tell me, but some of them are willing to say that, you know, even after they Google me. Um, Roberto and Shaheriar, do you all have any, uh, any contributions here? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a historic, uh, you know, union action or organizing campaign. Um, we think that um, you know, I, I hope it goes really well. I, you know, think that they've done a really amazing job of organizing a group of workers. What's interesting about this facility is it, it really did just, was just opening up right at COVID, that when COVID hit. I think the place has been open only just a little over a year at this point. And, you know, so I think a lot of those folks who um, came in, it's very similar to what, what happened here in Inland Empire 10 years ago, was Amazon was coming in right in tw right 2010, 2011, at the bottom of the recession, the city of San Bernardino had just declared bankruptcy. They said, we're gonna move into San Bernardino. There's all these opportunities for black workers, for Latino workers in, our, in your community. And everyone rushed in, they're like, this is great. Thank you for coming in. This first Amazon warehouse in California, all this tax revenue. And over the course of a couple of years, 
uh, people got disillusioned and realized that it wasn't, everything was cracked up to be. Originally, there was a lot of use of staffing agencies. Um, then even without staffing agencies, a lot of turnover and again, not people feeling like it wasn't really paying off. So I think what we've seen is that uh, it's an accelerated version of that in Alabama. Workers very, very quickly, once COVID hit, saw the reality compared to what they were promised and um, have decided to make a, you know, to make up the gap on their own, right? To say, okay, we're gonna hold you to actually providing the jobs that you promised us. So I think it's a you know really smart campaign. It's a really strategic, you know, because they're so deeply rooted in their community. Um, you know, that there's a long history of labor organizing in that in that region. And it's a you know really impressive effort with such a you know important uh, workforce. Uh, I just uh, hope it goes well and um, you know think it's gonna be again like an inspiration to workers either way. Um, workers, we, we hear from workers a lot about what's going on there. What, you know, how is that the kind of thing that can happen here? Um, and we, you know, we say it's in your hands, right? It's it's up to you. Um, the company's gonna come at you as hard as you can possibly imagine. And I think, I think is what we're seeing. Um, I think we're gonna learn a lot about the way Amazon responds um, in the next couple of months, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Anything to add, Roberto? You know, I think we're going to have to see entrenched campaigns, uh, especially in these uh, big uh, logistics hubs like Will County and Finland Empire. You know, that's that's what we're, um, you know, really trying to figure out. Uh, I don't. I think both at Warehouse Workers for Justice and the Warehouse Worker Resource Centers. So really, how how do we? What's what's the key to to organize this industry? So I, I I kind of alluded to it. You know, I. This industry is very strategic in terms of how these corporate actors operate overall in our society. And, you know, what these workers could have is an immense amount of labor power. Um, you know, so that, that's what we're really trying to figure out. So this is an exciting um, development and, you know, one we, we support and would like to see more of. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just ask one other follow-up question on that. I think, you know, Roberto, you were saying, um, that like what we need is is to see like a resurgence right like like post covid but you know also in covid right we need a resurgence of the labor movement we didn't we need a resurgence of of you know entrenched organizing campaigns um and so i guess i'm i, I wonder what you all um if you can lay out some of the components that we need in, in in order for that to happen right like what can folks what can like the folks who are here on this you know call um, learn from from these campaigns. How can they participate? But also, what do we need from the labor movement? What do we need from you know from from government? From um, you know from the kind of all of the the institutions around like what a resurgence would actually look like. Uh, you know, I think with the, the Black Lives Matter movement and before that the student strikes. Like I, I I just I feel like there's this there's real possibilities emerging. And I, hopefully the pandemic will end and that it will be a very dynamic moment, right? That maybe we can do things that we didn't think were, were possible uh, before. And we're going to need unprecedented action in order to recover our economy, to recover our public health. These warehousing and logistics uh, is, is a strategic choke point in, in these corporations. The, the, the Will County is the heart of 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 uh, Amazon in the Midwest. We have a tremendous amount of power if we get it organized. So I think we need to think about how we can come together with these other movements, how we can in, 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 embolden a militant labor movement that really organizes in these strategic points along with the community, along with other stakeholders to really win justice. You know, the, the, the problems in Will County are with the workforce. But, but much of the community is aggrieved too. You know, tiny Elwood, Illinois, $35 million in debt, you know, 2,200 people. I mean, how is that fair? I mean, look at how they've been, um, you know, how they've been taking this advantage of. You know, so how can we really come together to create real accountability for Amazon, but all these corporate actors? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, um, Warehouse Workers for Justice has been a model and we've been trying to replicate it somewhat is you know, really making sure that you are we are crossing those intersections across <clears throat> and paralleling with and supporting with the environmental justice movement um with you know the immigrant rights movement with the 
movement for black lives in our communities. I think the, the key is that workers have to be central to the organizing, but they need deep community support and, you know, the integration of, you know, again, like Amazon as the biggest employer in our region, our analysis is that everyone is affected by Amazon in some way. It's not just the workers. Uh, so many people, you know, work there at some point or their kid works there, or their uncle works there, right? Like everyone has a connection. And even if you don't have an employee relationship, um, everyone's breathing the same air, everyone's dealing with the same congestion, everyone's dealing with the same issues around the tax and taxation system in our region, the housing issues, all are connected in a place where, you know, changing Amazon would change people's lives. And so um, some of the work we've done recently has been organizing, um, you know, around community benefits and calling for community benefits, benefits agreements in the city of San Bernardino where Amazon is building, you know, several major warehouses, including an air freight terminal and calling for there to be not just benefits for the workers, but also, um, you know, improve conditions in terms of environmental mitigation, um, a community center um, for, for folks who live near the airport that are gonna be affected um, and to make sure that there's accountability to the, you know, to the city. And that's the kind of stuff that, um, you know, we've gotten folks from like Sunrise Movement and, you know, really young, young folks engaged saying this affects all of us. Amazon's a massive producer of greenhouse gases. Amazon's a massive, you know, massive producer of everything because they're such, so big. Um, if we can change the way this company operates and give communities a way to affect them, um, that'll be massive for everyone. And it starts with the workers, right? It starts with those workers organizing and us coming out and supporting them. And I think that's the kind of thing that um, will have a uh, you know broader impact when organizing happened in the you know the manufacturing plants in the mid mid 20th century those were full communities organizing or in the mining towns right like those were full communities organizing to improve those conditions because everyone was affected and i think until we get to that level where everyone says we're all affected we're all doing this together and um you know holding these companies accountable um it's going to be hard for us to hold such a big company accountable Ronald, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I, my, my thing is to hold the, comp the, the uh, company accountable. We also also have to help hold our elected official accountable because they're the one who make up the, the laws that government these companies also for those workers. Until we hold those elected official accountable, we're not gonna get very far because we need to find out who is donating to who. We know that these companies are donated to the Democratic and Republican Party. But when it comes down to passing laws to help temp workers and workers, who is getting paid out of that to vote this way and that way? We need to find out who is on the, who is on the table because if we ever had a chance to get the big spotlight, we can show America just how uh, workers in the warehouse are really being cheated unfairly with every condition. And, and, and that's the only thing is we, we have not been able to get that big spotlight on TV like Amazon getting Walgreens and Walmart get. If we can get that big spotlight and show them, because we have the evidence to show them of the work condition that we get, then that's when they would change. Then they would say, oh, we didn't know that. Wait a minute, you lying. We got, here we go right here. We sent it to your office. And that's the way, that's the biggest way it's going to change. So there's about four or five questions um, that, that we have here. And, and one asks, one calls attention to the Hunts Point strike in New York City which showed that distribution workers have a lot of leverage when they shut down critical points of the supply chain. Do you think that this leverage is reduced by companies like Amazon that have more redundancy built into their distribution networks? Does it make it, does, is somehow, is, is Amazon's presence changing the game, I guess, in terms of reducing people's leverage? Um, so that's one- I mean, point. Amazon designed design their system to, uh, to to get to mitigate that, they they saw that the, the power that unions have in in supply chains, they've designed their system specifically to try to avoid that, both through like the redundancy, but also through the the massive turnover of workers that they have, mm -hmm. um, and other things. So I think that's absolutely right. Well, and that leads to a kind of related question, which is, uh, somebody wanted to know about uh, describing the workers as it relates to how many of them, or if not how many, but some indication light of the full time versus the part time versus the temporary contract workers. What is what is that looking like in terms of that of the labor force? 
Uh, in my opinion, majority of them are full time, but uh, I would say 70% are, are from staffing agency and each company you looked at. Most of them are, are temp workers and stuff. 70% of them are temp workers. If you look into any company, you will see most of them have staffing agency in there. So they can keep a lot of the benefits down for the staffing agency rather than the, the, the workers. Because when you look at Amazon, when Amazon open up any company, they will bring most of their people from another state that had already been with Amazon over to where they open up the company. And then the rest of them will be temp workers. And then as they fade out, they might bring in some new workers. But like I said, the, the, for, as far as union rise, if, if, if you can get a union in there, I think Amazon will, I, well, to me, if you get a union, I think Amazon will see that the leverage that people have. The reason they don't want a union because they don't want to pay. And it shows you right there, Amazon do not want to pay. They say they do, but let's be real. They don't want to pay, but they use this trickery where if you get a union, you're going to have to pay union due. Where the amount of money that you'll be paying us, it'll be fair for those union dues. So that way you won't be able to fire me if I say, look, look at this work condition over here. That's the whole issue. When you're not have a union, you say something about work condition, you know more like a, a, a pancake at IHOP. You can flip for the next pancake to come along. And that's how Amazon and all these companies do. They use you like I have a pancake sale. They're just flipping you and passing you on. You know, you've all mentioned the issue of how many people and your coworkers and so on that have died from COVID. Somebody asked the question whether, uh, and I think some of this might be in your jungle uh, report, but do we have any figures on the number of warehouse workers who have died in the two locations, uh, Southern California and, and Illinois? or figures on illnesses or any anecdotal indications of the numbers of deaths and illnesses for work out, warehouse workers? I, I think we're at 179 outbreaks in um, warehousing and manufacturing uh, plants. I, I, I'm trying to, I was asking Tommy the exact figure of deaths. I wanna say like close to 400, uh, but don't quote me uh, on that. Um, but we, you know, we also think that it's underreported um, there's some back and forth going to, uh, with some of the worker centers of where there have been outbreaks uh, as it uh, relates to the Illinois Department of Public Health numbers. And we, we think a lot of workplaces are missing. Uh, and we wouldn't, wouldn't even be surprised if like deaths aren't even like fully captured. And that doesn't even really capture like people who get COVID and take it home and then have loved ones who, who may get sick or pass away, right? And we know that that uh, Black and Latinx communities are, are the hardest hit right now. Uh, our, our opinion is, um, you know, our, you know we, we, would, we would, I don't know if it's even a, an opinion, but we think that there's a strong correlation uh, between these workplaces and, and what's going on in our community. Um, and that, that warehousing and manufacturing is the, Second riskiest place to be, I think, speaks volumes. And um, ninety, you know, ninety percent of the people that uh, we interviewed for our report were people of color. What do folks think about the four to five dollar an hour hazard pay that some cities have been requiring for grocery workers? Might that be expanded to logistics workers? I think it's 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 really interesting. I mean, obviously, I think the workers deserve it and more. Um, what I'm worried about is that some in some of these workplaces, what we're hearing is that employers are saying, well, you're getting hazard pay, so we're going to, you know, you should be fine, right? Like, don't worry about protection. Don't worry about safety. Then that's the history of hazard pay back 100 years ago was that before there was kind of a standard health and safety situation, there was hazard pay, and that was what you got to take a risk. And so what I would say is, like, we can't trade people's safety for those dollars. We need to make sure those folks get paid what they are getting and more, but also make sure that we're, you know, redoubling our, our safety protections for workers and not kind of creating a situation where we're, we're creating an, a, a, an underclass of people who can be exploited physically in a way that, you know, okay, four or five bucks now, but what's going to happen to you 10, 15 years from now, or if you even make it that far. So I think that's, you know, it goes back to that kind of pre- OSHA era conversation. And I think it just shows that honestly, like we're, we're not as strong as we should be in, in, in the labor movement that we can't hold up for both. 
So some folks are asking questions that, you know, uh, well, actually, let me hold this particular question um, about what maybe uh, other folks can do. Someone wanted to know about how they could reach maybe uh, local officials. You mentioned, for example, they're calling out local officials. They want to know more about, about that. Somebody mentioned that here on, on the, on the, well, at the UIC campus and other university campuses, uh, faculty, alumni, for example, students, staff, they can utilize the, this uh, Amazon pickup sites. Is there anything that they can do utilizing that site as leverage to support workers? So I think there's some questions about, about how to support workers. Well, I, I, the, the, the students getting involved, uh, like the, you know, the uh, United Students Against Sweatshop Strategies, I think like I've been, Shaneri, I can tell you, I've been like talking about this for a year. So, and I repeat myself a lot, so I'm sorry. Uh, I would love to see something like that. So definitely reach out uh, to Warehouse Workers for Justice and like uh, um, Warehouse Worker Resource Center and WWJ are using more of a model where we, we work in coalition. The Athena Network is one big example uh, of that, but we do that in our locality. So definitely reach out to us. We cannot take uh, global giants like Amazon on by ourselves, not even the labor movement, right? And that's why we're kind of uh, approaching this from a multi-issue strategy. Um, you know, anti-monopoly, the environment, uh, uh, privacy, um, you know, get, get, get Amazon to stop using, um, stop doing, using tech for ice and things like that, right? So um, get with us. We definitely want to figure out how to uh, work together and also, you know, uh, uh, get our elected officials to really uh, take a look at some of these things as uh, some people have already alluded to. Do either... Uh... Are there the, are the others of you want to make comment on that? Well, uh, to piggyback on what Berto has said is that the, the, the UIC students do need to get involved because we, like I said before, we had an incident where DHS working the same, DHL working the same building with Mars, and we didn't know that they had closed down the whole side of DHL because they got infected. They had closed the whole side down, but no one told us. And see, these is the story, like I said, that need to be put out there to show that these companies are violating our safety, but yet our own state officials doing nothing as if they didn't know. And far as, you know, when people get sick, we want to know is who keeping a record of, wait a minute, how many employees you said came down with COVID? We want to know who got the records. Because I believe if we go to these companies, they're gonna put up that, well, Freedom of Information Act you have to get, wait a minute. If you care about your workers, let us know. See, they hide around the law, but we can't hide around the law because we don't have the law on our side. So that, 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 that'll be an issue right there. But if those students come out and make stories about it and put it out there, then you'll see government changes because now they're listening because you can't sweep nothing up under the rug no more. If the media won't come out with it, then you got to start with the little people and that would be the little people because they will be spreading it around on their friends and everything. So then that's the way we'll be, we can, um, then that's the way I guess government said, wait a minute, we better stop for we won't be back in office. So gentlemen, we've had a state representative on the call with us and uh, representative Karina Villa. And she has said that she's recommended that one of the things that also can be done is to, is to contact your state representatives and state senators and inform them of the issues. Uh, that, that, I, that, that maybe as more of them know about the issue, um, they, they may be responsive. Uh, they, and some, some are indicating that she's indicating, for example, that she stands with you all during this. I wanna, as we, as we begin to wrap this up, I, and, and we need to do it, I guess, rather quickly, because we've got CAN TV and I wanna round this out in the hour, but I wanna kind of pull it back to where we, where we started. Um, uh, Beth started talking about, she started this out by talking about this, you know, having us imagine, right, this line, uh, this huge supply chain that starts with the manufacturing, but, you know, sometimes in China, a lot of them in China or wherever else it might be, right, and the importance of the warehouse in this chain. But there are, there's all these, um, oh, I'm sorry, thank you for correcting that for me. She's a, a she's a state, uh, Tanina Villa is, is a state senator. Um, uh, I needed to make sure I got that accurate. Um, so, but anyway, back to this, you know, idea of the critical notion of warehouse in this supply chain, but it has, 
the whole, you know, the warehouse work is so important, but it has all these other reverberations. And I think some of you made reference to it um, about, um, you know, about land use, about transportation. I think Roberto, for example, you gave a whole litany of impacts. And someone did post in here that in two weeks, this conversation will be continued and sort of broadened as part of a, the Chicago Environmental Justice Network doing a summit on transportation. They've been raising issues a lot around transportation. But I'm wondering if Shahariar, if you could maybe say something a little bit about the Inland Empire and how all of logistics has really fun, you know, changed so dramatically that landscape in Southern California and then maybe some of the issues that you, Roberto and Ronald see uh, coming down the, the pike here in Chicago that, uh, that make the warehouse working central to, but, but, uh, but is, is a, a much bigger issue even for us in the region to be paying attention to. So Shahar, sorry, if you could maybe start with that. Yeah, I mean, like I, like I started with, uh, this is the dominant sector of our regional economy and COVID has made it even more severe, right? Like a couple of years ago, people were kind of, oh, well, Amazon's the only place that's hiring. Now that's really true, right? Um, that is the only place that's really hiring and that is the place that is growing. They've added, I think, four additional fulfillment centers in our region in the last year. Um, additionally, this uh, air freight terminal is gonna open up in a couple of months, uh, another 5,000 uh, jobs. So it's a massive employer. Um, and it's uh, you know, a dynamic where people feel like we have to really you know, look out for that company and, and we need to make sure that they're held accountable, but also that uh, you know, people, people are afraid of, of standing up to Amazon because they're such a dominant employer. So that's, that's what we're always balancing, but we know that they can't afford to do the right thing. They can't afford to uh, to benefit our communities, both the workers and 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 the community more broadly. Thank you, uh, Ronaldo or Roberto. Uh, I just want to take a moment to say, like, we can't let uh, North Point and the trade strong arm the community of Elwood in accepting three thousand acres of more warehousing. It's complete. It's undemocratic what they're trying to do to that community. And people need to listen to why they're aggrieved and need, it needs to stop. The second thing is that we need to pour resources into making sure that the pandemic ends and warehouses and workers take the vaccine. There's a lot of hesitation around this issue. I repeat myself about this too, um, but it's not gonna be an easy process and we're gonna need a thoughtful approach and to work with groups like Warehouse Worker Resource Center and Warehouse Workers for Justice in order to accomplish this. That's, that's that was a good that was a good one, huh? Beth, do you want to do you want to say something? No, I just wanted to thank um, our our panelists for their time. Um, I know y'all are, are doing really important work, and I really appreciate y'all coming to talk with us today and um, and about, and your general work in the world. So thanks for educating us and being with us. Uh, shout out to Great City staff, um, to the Center for Urban Economic Development, also, and to the. Latino Research Initiative of the Great Cities Institute. And to all of you, um, really appreciate this. Um, wanna end on a final comment too about that both uh, Senator Villa and I think another somebody else asked the question uh, about vaccinations, right? And the importance of getting uh, the vaccination. So uh, Illinois Unidos has been uh, interfacing with uh, the warehouse workers and some of the other workers to think more about strategies to get um, uh, to get those vaccine, vaccine, vaccines out. So that's a really uh, important question. Um, and then uh, and the other thing is that Can TV, as I mentioned, has been here. We always, we love Can TV. They're Chicago's public access TV. And uh, uh, we've just posted in the, in the chat there where you can see their link and it'll be, uh, it'll be on their website. And we will have the, also the, um, the tape on, uh, on, on our website as well. I want to thank you, Beth, Shahariar, Ronald, Roberto. We really appreciate the time and we appreciate all of your time. We know it's precious um, and it means a lot to us that you've shared this hour with us. And uh, let's just keep on keeping on, huh? Thank you so much. <laughs>